Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you all today. If I have not had the pleasure of meeting you, my name is Nathaniel, and I'm a pastor here at Freedom Bible Church. And before we dive into our scriptures today, I have two special announcements for you. Announcement number one is this. Um, if you've been with us for a while, of course we know that Hurricane Ian hit us and affected us and we went out around our community and helped our own community. But the year after that, there was another hurricane that hit in the middle towards the panhandle. And what we did during that time is because of Ian, it was really on our hearts to help the people who were affected with the hurricane. And so we went, we got tarps, we got um, diapers, wipes, Gatorades, everything that we could get, supplies, and we brought it to them. And they loved that. They loved it. And so, of course, what we want to do again, now that we've had another hurricane that has affected the panhandle, is we want to do the same exact thing. Um, we want to give them specifically, we're looking for tarps, diapers, and wipes, and Gatorade. So if, if God places it on your heart, and you would like to donate those things, just bring them here to the church. What we're going to do is we're going to take donations this whole week, and we're going to take donations next Sunday will be our final Sunday, and then we're going to deliver all of that on Monday, okay? And so if you want to, please bring those donations. The second announcement is this. As you know, here at Freedom, we have been growing at an exponentially fast rate, right? Um, I mean, look at the room now. It's just been incredible. God has been doing so much work here, and we're so excited that more and more people are coming and hearing the truth of God. But the truth is this, we can't fit you all, okay? And so in light of that, we will officially be starting a Saturday night service. And that Saturday night service is going to be um, probably at 5 p.m. on Saturdays. And we're going to start that either in December or during the beginning of January, okay? But what that means is this. We need you. We need your help. The Bible is so clear that we are a body. We work together. There, there is no one man. There's no a group of small group of men that work for God. We are one body and we work all together for the glory of God. And so because we're adding another service, we need volunteers. We need servants. We need people who are willing to come and serve on that Saturday night. And so if you are here, especially, listen, if you are new and you're like, I just came here, I'm excited, I want to serve, I need a spot to serve, this is perfect for you, okay? And what we've done is we put a sign-out sheet out in the front, and that sign-up sheet is specifically for serving on Saturday. And so whether that's one Saturday a month, two, whatever you can do, if you want to serve on Saturdays, just put your name on that sheet, and we will reach out to you and figure out what will be best for you to serve, okay? So be praying about that. Be praying about our church, our leaders, praying for our leaders, that God continues to guide us in his truth and for his glory, okay? Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll dive into our scriptures. Lord Jesus, we come before you, and we are just so thankful, Lord, for everything that you have done for us. I thank you for your word. I thank you that we can continually come to it and be strengthened by everything that you say. And Lord, as we look at these verses today, as we look at your humanity, your struggles, your suffering, I pray that it would help us to be encouraged, knowing that you understand how we feel. You understand our weak flesh. You understand what it feels like to be under immense pressure as we suffer in our lives. Help us to be like you. Help us to pray that we live for the glory of our Father, trusting in everything that he's doing in our lives, knowing, God, that you are going to receive the glory in all things. Help us, encourage us, strengthen us in your word today. 
It's in your name we pray. Amen. As we come to John 12, this is the final week of Jesus' life. Jesus is coming towards the end of his life. And I will say, in the next couple chapters of John, these are some of my favorite chapters in Scripture. And in fact, if you have your Bible with you today, or even if you have one at home, some Bibles, we call them red letter Bibles, because what they do is they take the specific words of Jesus and they put them in red, right? And if you flip through the next five chapters of John, you're going to see that the whole thing is almost just red. Because what John does is he records so many of the words of Jesus for us. And I will tell you this as a Christian, these words are so comforting to us. They're so comforting to us. The words of our God, the words of our Savior should be so comforting to our soul as we read them. And what we see here as we start is that Jesus himself, Jesus himself is downcast in his soul. He's downcast in his soul. Let's read John 12, 27 through 28. Jesus says this, he says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Jesus says that his soul is troubled. The Greek word here is torasso, torasso. And that means that he is troubled down to the core down to the depths of his very soul. He is in anguish. He is facing heartache. And what we see here is we see the true humanity of Jesus. All the time in the Christian church, we believe and we affirm that Jesus is fully man and fully God. And it kind of struck me as I was looking at these verses that the last time I preached on Sunday, my sermon specifically focused on the deity of Jesus, that he is fully God. As Hebrews says, he is the exact imprint of the Father, the exact nature of the Father. But now as we come to our verses today, we are now focusing on the humanity of Jesus. What does it mean that Jesus is fully man, that he took on human flesh? A lot of times when we talk about Jesus as being a man, we can almost think of him as being, he's a man with a cheat code, right? It's like, yes, he was man, but it was easier for him. And he had an easier life because he was God. In fact, I would actually say, I think it was harder for him. Because of the suffering that he faced, the trials that he went through. And so when we say he's fully man, what we mean is this, that in every way we struggle, in every way that we suffer, Jesus faced the same weaknesses. He grew tired just as we grow tired. He grew hungry just as we grow hungry. He felt pain. He felt heartache. He had anguish in his soul. Hebrews 4.15 says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. He was tempted just as we are. He was tempted in every temptation that we face as we suffer as we feel the temptations and the grabbings of this world to be like the world, to live like the world, he faced those same pressures, but yet he was without sin. I love as if we go to the next chapter in Hebrews, Hebrews 5, 7, it says this, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications 
with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Look at that. With loud cries and tears, he came to the Father because of the pressure that he had on himself. And what is the pressure that he's facing here? Why is Jesus under such an immense pressure? Well, he tells us, he says, because this hour is coming. The hour of what? The hour of the cross. The cross is coming. He is a week away from having the sins of all of his people placed upon himself. And the wrath of God is about to be poured out on his body. And he feels the pressure of it. He feels the pressure of it to the point where his mind is thinking, what do I do? What do I say? Do I say to God, take this away from me, God? I can't do this. I can't take this pressure. Take it away. But then he says, but this is why I've come. This is my purpose. My purpose was to come and die for the sins of my people. This is why I am here. And so we see the struggle inside the flesh of our Savior. You know, as we look at this, don't we have so much understanding of this? As Christians, as we live our lives and as we struggle in the same ways and as we say as we face the same pressures that our Savior faced, there are so many times in our life where we're like, man, I can't do this anymore. I, I can't take this suffering. I can't take this pain. I look around me. I, I look at the situations that I'm in and I, I see the world and how they hate God and they hate Christ and all they want is sin. And all they want to do is blaspheme his name and get rid of them as much as they can. And, and we come and we're weak in our flesh and we face these pressures. And just like Christ, especially when we're weak in our faith, and a lot of times, especially when we're young in our faith, what do we do when we face trials? Our immediate reaction is, take it away. God, take it away. I can't do it anymore. I can't do it anymore, right? I've been there. I've been there. God, I, I can't do this. Please just take it away. But as we grow in our faith, as we grow in the knowledge of who our God is, and as we grow in the knowledge of God's word, we come to the point where we still feel that same pressure. We still feel the pain of our suffering. But yet we come to God and we're like, God, I know that I'm suffering and I know I have this pain, but I know what your word says. I know that you say in James that my suffering is going to produce steadfastness in my soul. I know that this suffering is going to make me perfect and complete. I know that you say these things to me, Lord. I know you tell me in Hebrews chapter 12 that you are going to discipline me because you love me. You love me, God. So you're going to discipline me and you're going to make me more like Christ so I can live and be like him. And I know that you tell me in Romans 8, Father, that ultimately you are going to work all things for my good and I can trust you. I can trust what you say. See, this is why Jesus in this time, he's saying, man, as much as I want to say, Father, take it from me, I know that my Father's will is for me to do this so that it will bring Him glory. And it will be for my glory. It will be for my good. I have come for this purpose. And that is why I love Jesus' simple prayer where He simply says this, Father, Glorify your name. Father, glorify your name. And I would dare say that in every situation that we are in, 
and every trial and every suffering that we face as Christians, the greatest thing that we can pray is, Father, glorify your name. Father, glorify your name. Why? Why is that the greatest thing we can pray? Because we know he will. We know that he will glorify his name. We know that in every circumstance and everything that we face, that God will receive the glory. That God will glorify himself. That we can trust our God and trust our Savior. That when we suffer for his sake, he will say to us, I will get the glory. Don't you worry. Don't you worry. Because I will get the glory. Your situation will bring me glory. And that can bring us peace. That we can trust in him. And it's such a simple prayer. Father, I don't, I don't know what else to say. But glorify your name. And that's why the father answers Jesus in verse 28. And he says this, then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. I have glorified my name. Son, in everything that I have done so far, I have glorified my name. I sent you and you took on human flesh and you have done everything that I've asked you to do. And you went out to the people and you have proclaimed every word that I have asked you to proclaim and you have been glorifying my name the whole time. But son, don't you forget, I will glorify it again. I will glorify it in your death. Don't you worry. My plan of redemption will work And I will be glorified and people will come to me and they will be drawn to me and my name will be proclaimed throughout all the earth. So don't you worry because I will glorify my name again. There's the peace. There's the peace. And again, he says the same thing to us. Don't worry. Don't worry. I will glorify my name and everything that goes on around you my name will be glorified. And as we look, you know, it's, it's a great question. How does the Father receive glory in the death of Christ? How does he receive glory in the death of his son? I love Philippians 2, 4 through 11. Because we see the son and the father receiving the glory. It says this. Let each of you look not only to his own interests but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, that's human flesh, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So watch this. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The cross humbled The son came and humbled himself to the point of the cross. And so the father exalted his name above every other name. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And that will be true. Every person right now who denounces Christ, one day they will bow and they will say, he is Lord. He is Lord, right? Exalted above all, glorified above all. And then after saying, All of that, what does he say? To the glory of God the Father. To the glory of God the Father. He will receive glory in the death and redemption of his son. Because his plan of redemption works. It works. And he is faithful to everything that he has said. And he has done the work that he has proclaimed. And he will receive glory in all of it, in all of it.
How incredible. We could stop right here. We could pray right now. How incredible is that? He receives glory for it all. The last thing I want to say on this point before we move on to our next verses is this. Fast forward one week, and the night before Jesus is on the cross, where do we find our Savior? We find him on his knees, and the pressure is so intense that he is sweating drops of blood. And what does he pray? He says, Father, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. How striking is that? Where here we are a week before, and he's, he's sent, contemplate, should I say, Father, take this from me? But I came for this hour. So he doesn't say it then. But yet a week later, the pressure's so strong. He says, Father, take this cup from me. But nevertheless, not my will, you'll be done. What does this tell us? This tells us that both are so good, are so good. You're gonna have times in your life where your faith is strong. And you're gonna say, Father, I don't like this pain and I don't like this suffering, but I trust your will. And I trust you. I know what you're doing. Glorify your name. And then you're going to have points in your life where the pressure has become so strong and your body is so weak that you will be on your knees and you will say, Father, Father, please take this from me. Please take this from me. I, I, can't, I can't do this anymore. But in both circumstances, what does Jesus say? Your will be done. Your will be done. Both are so good. Both are so good. Because we pray for his will and we pray for his glory. Let's go ahead and move on. John 12, 29 through 33. Here's the people's response to the voice of God. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. But Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. And what's striking here is everybody around heard the voice of God. They heard it. But yet, in their disbelief, in the disbelief in their heart, they try to explain it away. Some of them just, they take the supernatural and they just make it natural. Oh, uh, that must have thundered. Must have been some thunder outside. Same thing people do today. Some of them explain it supernaturally, but yet they still get it so wrong. Some of them, oh, an angel spoke to him. An angel spoke to him? No. It was the Father who spoke. The Father who spoke. And see, what we see here is that people can still, they hear the voice of God. They hear it. But yet they're still deaf to it. They're still deaf to it. They, they hear it, but yet they don't hear it at all. And strikingly enough, this is still happening today. It's still happening Right now, right now. See, right now, you are all hearing the word of God. You are hearing the voice of God being proclaimed. Not my voice, not my voice. His voice in scripture. And yet, you still don't hear it. You still don't hear it. Your ears are deaf to his words. And I ask you today, have you humbled yourself to listen to the voice of God? To listen to what he has to say? Don't be deaf to his voice. Listen to him. And it takes humility. It takes humility to go, you know what? God, I want to understand. I want to hear your word. And I want to listen to what you have to say. And, and sad enough, Jesus says to them, this voice didn't come for me. It came for you. 
It came for you so you could know. God the Father just said, this is, this is him. This is the Messiah. This is the one we should trust in. And yet they didn't hear it. How sad. It came for them and they missed it. They missed it, right? And so Jesus says, listen, this came for you because you need to understand this. Verse 31 and 32. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. The judgment of this world is coming. The ruler of this world, he's going to be cast out. What does he mean the judgment is coming? He means this. Think about it this way. At the cross, when Jesus suffered with pain and torture, mocking, and he died on the cross, who thought they won? Who thought they won? The religious leaders thought they won. They got him. They finally got rid of this Jesus guy. Satan thought he won. But here's the problem. They didn't win. They lost. They lost. And so Jesus says, here's what you don't understand. Listen to me. This is so important. So important. At the cross, you either find your eternal salvation or you find your eternal judgment. Or you find your eternal judgment. Because if you reject the cross, the cross is your condemnation because you reject the Son and you reject His work of salvation for you. And that's your judgment. That's the judgment of this world. But if you accept it, if you come to the cross and say, I believe, I believe in Christ. I believe in his work of salvation. I believe that it's the forgiveness of my sin. You will find eternal salvation, eternal redemption. That's why he says the judgment of this world is coming because the world rejects him and they reject his cross and they reject his work. But then he says the ruler of this world will be cast out. And the ruler of this world he's talking about is Satan, is Satan. See, before the cross, Satan had dominion of this world. In fact, he says, when Satan is tempting Jesus in the wilderness, and he comes to the final temptation, and he shows Jesus all the nations of the world, he says to Jesus, if you bow to me, I will give you all of this because it's all been given to me. I have ownership of it all. But yet what does Christ say at the cross? Guess what? There's a change of ownership coming. It's not going to be his anymore. It's going to be mine. I am going to defeat Satan at the cross. I am going to fulfill the first prophecy in Genesis that you're going to bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. He's going to crush your head. And you're going to be defeated. And see, Satan, he doesn't have dominion over us anymore. He doesn't bond us to our sin anymore. We are not afraid of death anymore. Why? Because Christ defeated our sin and he defeated our death. And Satan has no power over us anymore. That's why in Colossians 2, he says he disarmed the ruler of this world. He took away his weapon. What was his weapon? Death. He took it away. He's got no weapon on you anymore. You don't need to be afraid of him anymore. You don't need to be afraid of death anymore because Christ conquered it on the cross. I love Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, talking about Jesus, likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. He took him away. He said, you are powerless. Death is no more on my people on my people and I do want you to understand this I want you to understand this 
Satan still has power. He still has power. 1 Peter 5 says he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking people to devour. Seeking people to devour. And there are still people to this day who sadly are still stuck under his dominion. They're still stuck. But those in Christ are free. We're free. And he has no power over us anymore. He may tempt us. He may make us suffer like Job. He may give us lies and heartache and pain. But he can't touch you anymore. You are Christ. You belong to him. And in fact, listen, his final judgment is coming. His final judgment's coming. Revelation tells us clearly he is going to be bound for a thousand years, and then when that's done, he will be thrown into the lake of fire. Christ's victory is already sealed, it's already done. The victory is coming, and it belongs to Christ. It belongs to him. And therefore, it belongs to us. It belongs to us, right? Because we are his. So good. So good. And so now. Coming to our final verses, John 12, 34 through 36, it says, So the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So the Israelites there, remember, who know the Old Testament, they've grown up on the Old Testament. They say to him, wait, hold on. You're talking about the Son of Man, and you're saying that he's going to be lifted up. They recognize and know he's saying that he's going to die, that he's going to die. And they're saying, but wait, if the Son of Man is going to die, I thought the Old Testament says that the Son of Man is going to reign forever. How can he reign forever if he's going to die? So then sarcastically they go, who is this Son of Man? Which one are you talking about? Because that's not the one we know about. But see, here's the problem. Here's the problem. And we still have this problem today. These Jewish people, they were looking at the Old Testament. And they were only looking at the verses that they wanted to see. And they are right. Daniel says that the Son of Man will sit on the throne and all dominion and everything will be his forever, forever. They're not wrong. That prophecy is true. But here's the problem. What about Isaiah 53 that clearly says that the Messiah must first come and suffer for the sake of his people, that he must literally bear their sins. He will be pierced for their transgressions, crushed for their iniquities, right? And then what about Psalm 22? That is a clear description of the Messiah suffering. It's a clear description of Jesus suffering on the cross. What about their own Levitical system where God says that blood is required for forgiveness of sin? It's required. And see, in all things, We must take the whole counsel of God. You cannot take certain verses and believe in those, but not believe in the rest. And the Old Testament paints the picture perfectly that the Messiah will come and he will suffer for the sake of his people first. And then he will come and he will set up a kingdom and he will reign forever he will reign forever and that's exactly what jesus has done he suffered for us he set up his kingdom and one day he will return and he will reign forever he will reign forever and so we must take it all into account listen there are so many pastors today Who they're going to tell you a verse here and a verse there. And then they want you to think, so God never wants you to suffer. He always wants to bless you. Guys, we have to take the whole scripture 
into account. And there's something to say here too. Study the Old Testament. Know the Old Testament. It is just as important to us today as it was before the New Testament was even written. It's just as important that we know it all. And so in our final verses, here's what Jesus does. He doesn't even answer their question. He doesn't answer their question. He just simply says this. Verse 35 and 36. So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of the light. Jesus has already called himself the light of the world. They know that he's talking about him. And he tells them, listen, the light's not going to be here for much longer. I'm going to be leaving soon. And before I am gone, you need to believe in the light. You need to walk in the light because if you don't, you will walk in darkness. You will walk in darkness. You won't know where you're going. You won't be able to see. And sadly, your darkness will lead you to hell. But if you walk in the light, if you believe in the light, you will become sons of the light. And in the same way, today, 2,000 years later, we know that Jesus tells us this, I am coming soon. I am coming soon. The return of Christ is coming. And I plead with you, just like Jesus pled with them, come to the light. Walk in the light. Devote yourself to the light. Don't wait, because then it will be too late. It'll be too late. Walk in the light. Let him change your life. Let him show you how great he is. Let him show you his plan of redemption. Let him show you the beautiful eternity that he wants to give you. Let him be your truth. Would you bow your heads and pray with me as we close? And as everybody's heads are bowed and everybody's eyes are closed, I just want to give you the opportunity. If you're here today and You've never heard anything like this before. Let me just say this. Jesus is our God. He came into the world because he loves us and he wants to save sinners. And if you feel the drawing on your heart right now to come to him, that is him. That is his spirit speaking to you, saying, come to me. Come to my light. Trust in me and I will give you redemption. I will give you salvation. I will give you an eternal home. I will make you a son of light and guide you every day of your life. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Come to him. Father, thank you for these words. Lord, I pray everybody in here is encouraged, Lord knowing that you're working all things for your glory. I know right now there are people in this room and they are suffering. They're suffering. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen them and you would help them to know, God, that you are for them. You are always working for your people. You're always working for your good. And even the suffering around us, the suffering of our people, the suffering overseas, that we see in so many different nations, God, you are doing this for your glory. And we can trust you. We can believe you. You are a faithful God. You are a true God. Always true to your promises. Help us to always live by faith in you and trust in you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand? Let's, let's worship one more time.